So uh, your first reading uh, for uh, this week was the Rand group, and um, there's a really interesting tension in the readings this week uh, between the Chomsky uh, approach and theory uh, of, of how uh, we should be relating and thinking about terror um, and the, uh, the, the, the Rand piece. So, so we need to kind of try to unpack that and think about it. Now, um, now th there is a, a beautiful definition in the Rand piece, um, which, you know, having given a brief overview of terrorism, there's a, a definition given by a Bruce Hoffman, who is an, an expert in the field, who basically says that terrorism is the deliberate creation Ex uh, exportation of fear um, through violence or the threat of violence in the pursuit of political change. And um, that's interesting for us because it, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's effectively an open enough definition that it can be used to speak to the terror of groups, uh, religious groups, for example, but also even state terror. Um, and as we will see, um, there's a, a lot at stake in that question about state-sponsored terrorism. Um, whether it exists, uh, to what extent it exists, is not something that American uh, analysts have been traditionally very good at uh, answering. Um, one concept that really comes up in the Rand piece is the concept of jihad, uh, which, of course, technically means to strive, um, but the article includes within it uh, the modern definition uh, that has been used by contemporary, um, by, by contemporary, I mean, in the last 80 uh, years or so, um, the definition of modern, used by modern Islamist scholars in the context of post-colonization, people like Said Qutb um, in the 1950s. And what Rand argues is that religious terrorists um, based on uh, especially the sort of notion of of um, um, of, of jihad uh, can be more destructive in their violence, and I think that's an that's a point where I certainly felt there was a strong uh, tension uh, with Chomsky because Chomsky um, would would argue because he's much more focused on the possibility of state-sponsored terrorism that really Rand um, have a serious flaw in their argument at that, at that point. Because if you're arguing that religious terrorists can be more bloodthirsty and more destructive in their violence, you end up ignoring um, um, uh, how in the course of modern history state-sponsored terrorism has killed immeasurably greater numbers of people than religious terror. Um, and, and that's just a strange thing to see Rand uh, overlooking, having offered a definition that leaves the possibility open for, for state-sponsored terror. I mean, just think about it from the perspective of, of American uh, um, sponsored terrorism in, um, in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, for example, or in uh, Iraq. Um, one of the greatest sort of acts if if we go back to our definition and we look at terrorism being the deliberate creation of fear through violence or the threat of violence in the pursuit of political change um then um america has pursued political change in cuba through a, a very strong uh, effort at public intimidation um for several decades now the cuban embargo um which has been maintained by the united states of america um is one of the longest ongoing terrorist operations in history, and it's killed many many thousands of people. Um, you know, not to mention some of the stuff that that Chomsky will get into in the next page. But also, I just think you know, to really sort of nail it, you know, sometimes you see in the public record um, quotes from American uh, statesmen and stateswomen that really kind of take your breath away sometimes. Um, if America is so um, keen to engage and win something called the war on terror, then why effectively is, does, does American foreign policy seem to be oriented towards strategies that seem almost like intentionally or willfully oriented to the production of terrorism, to the generation of terrorism? 
um, there's a famous quote from Madeleine Albright in 1996. And she was at that point in time, the US ambassador to the United Nations under Bill Clinton, uh, where she appeared on, a, on, on the program 60 Minutes. And the, the journalist Leslie Stahl asked her, uh, we have heard that half a million children have died um, in Iraq due to the ongoing US blockade of Iraq uh, since the George Bush senior years. And of course, Bill Clinton was responsible for overseeing this blockade. And Leslie Saul goes on and says, I mean, that's more children than died in Hiroshima. And I guess we just have to ask, is the price worth it? Uh, Leslie Stahl asks the question, is the price worth it? And Albright says, well, I think it's a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Um, and just sort of at that moment, you have to sort of stop and think and do a little reality check um, where Madeleine Albright later backed away from the claim and said she'd been cornered and um, sort of put in a position where she hadn't had time to properly interpret the question. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes the first answer is the true answer. Uh, the instinctive answer is the answer that, that you know, um, is, is, is sort of more reflective of the in intuition and insight of the, uh, uh, the policymaker in, in question. And I, I'm pretty certain if you, um, you know, look uh, at, the, at the, the, the case, you know, Madeleine Albright's later response was that, well, it was Saddam Hussein's fault. Um, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's not clear that uh, Saddam Hussein uh, was responsible for uh, um, a blockade uh, which um, blocked uh, very simple medical instruments um, like um, intubators for uh, uh, prematurely born children. Um, the US wouldn't even allow um, incubators to uh, go into the country. And so really they ended up using kind of stone age uh, technologies um, in their maternity wards, in their hospitals, and a lot of children did die. Um, it's not clear how um, those incubators would have helped uh, Saddam Hussein's military operation um, or would have, um, you know, uh, created uh, some kind of um, military menace that the U.S. would have had to face subsequently were Saddam Hussein to, to start causing trouble again. So um, many people, many scholars argue that that was a very cynical choice. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just something that Rand needs to uh, think about, I think, in their piece. So um, just, just to skip ahead, uh, one final point that I think is worth raising from this piece is about the um, future uh, of terrorism and one, I thought, very insightful point that they raised at the end was just that we need to understand terrorism and terrorists in a, in a manner that's more complex than uh, the simple sort of evildoers uh, rhetoric of uh, George Bush Jr. Um, in fact, people like Al-Qaeda and, um, y you know, Osama bin Laden uh, have uh, never shied away from expressing quite serious thought out political goals uh, for their actions. Um, they are not just evil doers. Remember the definition says that you're um, trying to uh, use violence or the threat of violence in the pursuit of political change. So evil doers just cause violence for the sake of violence. Um, in fact, Saddam Hussein, uh, excuse me, uh, some of them, nothing to do with it, of course, um, Osama bin Laden and um, uh, Al-Qaeda have uh, expressed political goals, including um, getting uh, US and Western troops out of the Holy Lands in Saudi Arabia, and also improving uh, the relationship uh, between Israel and the Palestinians, um, arguing that the Israelis were currently persecuting the Palestinians. So. Um, I mean, I can remember when I was doing my master's degree way back in 1998, and, um, you know, there was a strong sense even then that uh, um, the um, that 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 uh, there were political goals um, being pursued by uh, by um, Al Qaeda. And uh, that was, of course, 
back uh, when the embassy bombings were happening, um, there were infamous uh, faxes that were sent by Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden to Western um, uh, embassies, telling them to um, get their forces out of the Middle East. Um, so there's a strong uh, political uh, literacy in in, uh, in in Bin Laden's um, early messages uh, to uh, to the Western world. Um, so much so even that I think there's been a couple of books written on this. Um, so we move on to to Chomsky. Um, now, like Chalmers Johnson, Noam Chomsky, uh, and Chalmers Johnson, of course, is a, if you've not heard of him, he's um, an, another sort of very good scholar of the same ilk as Chomsky. Um, but Chomsky's obviously very famous and has made a long career out of critically scrutinizing the official history of, of American national security. For example, in um, in in, in uh, you know his long career, he used to be just a, a linguist, but he um, you know has just written so many books, and um, his books have been held up by presidents at the United Nations uh, General Assembly, uh, sort of invoked as ways of challenging um, the rhetoric of uh, U.S. governments as they try to legitimize what many people see as highly problematic and power centric. Um, policies, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis, um, South America. So there is a long history, uh, according to Chomsky, of US-sponsored state terror. Um, and what he sort of principally tries to argue is that there's a tendency, a terrible tendency, uh, for us to sort of constantly berate uh, them for their terrorism against us and never really think about the strategies and means that we are using uh, against them as potentially terroristic, um, you know, the, the idea being, of course, that America is special, uh, ex an exceptional country, a country that believes in democracy and uh, freedom and human rights, and of course, therefore, any military action that America might take against um, a foreign uh, opponent uh, would, by definition, be considered to be sort of on the cause of freedom fighting as opposed to terrorism, but... Um, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, as uh, as the as the Akbal Ahmed piece will will argue. So there's a lot of information in the Chomsky piece, and I thought in my little commentary I might just instead of um, parsing it out fully for you, I might just offer some interventions and um, hopefully some empirical clarification for you, so that um, you understand uh, one or two of the terms. Uh, that, and one or two of the controversies and cases that, that Chomsky is referring to. Um, one important example would be uh, the uh, Nicaragua versus United States case in the ICJ, which Chomsky refers to as the World Court in 1986. So in that year, the ICJ held that the United States had violated international law by supporting under Reagan the, the Contras, the so-called Contras, um, uh, who were a uh, sort of right-wing paramilitary group um, that were engaged in rebellion against the Nicaraguan government, which was a socialist government, uh, democratically elected. Um, and uh, the U.S. intervened on the side of the Contras. Uh, you may remember um, the famous Oliver North scandal. Um, but this case specifically revolved around American efforts to put mines in Nicaraguan harbors, fishing harbors, and um, supply weapons to the Contras. So the the U.S. Um, was found guilty of state-sponsored terrorism in this uh, case, and um, the U.S. of course, um, because there is no real, as we discussed last week, there's no real proper enforcement mechanism um, for these kinds of cases. So for a large, powerful country like the United States, there's no real um, uh, handcuffs that can be slapped on. So the U.S. is capable then and, and did subsequently block the enforcement of the judgment um, at the level of the United Nations Security Council and thereby prevented Nicaragua from obtaining any compensation for the damage the United States had done. Um, in this vein, then, um, Chomsky takes us through um, a series of examples, um, including um, United States foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Cuba, and um, the intention of overthrowing the uh, the communist government there, 
and also um, talks a little bit about the history of liberation theology as it relates to the School of the Americas, which is currently called, as you can see on the slide here, the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. Um, so to understand some of this history, we've got to go back to Eisenhower and to Kennedy. Um, Cuba had uh, liberated itself from the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, says Chomsky. So what was the Monroe Doctrine? Um, I think that's something I should maybe help uh, you with here. So um, Ma President James Monroe uh, was the uh, president who elaborated this strategy uh, in 1823 and said in, the, um, uh, in his State of the Union address to Congress that um, further efforts by European nations to, to intervene, to try to take control of any independent states in North or South America would be viewed as, and I quote, the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the United States. In other words, if you were attacking one, you were attacking them all. Now, that might seem to be kind of very um, brotherly of the United States in an effort to help um, the uh, independence movements of these uh, South American countries as they were emerging from the yoke of European imperialism. Um, however, um, subsequently, that... Um, Monroe Doctrine has been interpreted um, um, a little more widely uh, by the likes of Chomsky as um, a coded kind of statement suggesting that basically South America is considered America's backyard and therefore um, um, you know um, any any sort of shift towards socialism or communism would necessarily be interpreted as foreign intervention by uh, powers seeking to undermine U.S. interests, and therefore it would give America sort of a basis or a grounds of intervening and trying to undermine those movements. So under President Kennedy, then, there was a huge fear that, um, you know, decades of anti-imperialism uh, and anti-colonial struggle in South America and in Latin America would sort of tip over uh, because the poor in those countries had been badly treated by their imperial masters, uh, by their... Um, and also by the elites who had taken up government in the aftermath of decolonization. So um, there was a strong worry that, um, you know, the, 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 the pyramid of property rights, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, sort of um, primitive capitalism that was developing in, uh, in these countries would, would perhaps be challenged, not just in Cuba, of course, but uh, CIA had already under Eisenhower been involved in Guatemala uh, the Cadrillo regime um, had been supported and sponsored by um, Eisenhower at the behest of the United Fruit Company. And there's a long history of these interventions. So the, the U.S. has never hesitated to, um, even where people will might democratically, such as in Chile in 1973, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, the U.S. has not hesitated ever to um, to sort of try to intervene, even, even against the wishes of, uh, democratic wishes of the people in those countries um, to to undermine the cause of socialism um, in, in the South um, because ultimately it would undermine the uh, property regime um, in South America and uh, prevent uh, corporate power um, getting the cheap uh, deal that it gets um, for access to raw materials and agricultural commodities um, and that history goes all the way back to Guatemala, where, in fact, the United Fruit Company um, asked Eisenhower to intervene um, in the situation to prevent um, the company being taxed by Guatemalan authorities uh, at the uh, value at, of the land that they were holding. They wanted the um, cheap sort of subsidized taxes that they'd had to pay up to that point to be continued. And Eisenhower happily obliged and... Uh, engaged in paramilitary activity against the government in Guatemala, Bill Clinton, uh, subsequently in his administration decades later, apologized for this, there were the death of 100,000 people um, in Guatemala at, at the hands of US-sponsored state terrorists. So, um, you know, again, it just sort of goes back to this idea that, uh, you know, there's a long history of um, bloodshed um, 
at the hands of uh, state-sponsored terrorism. And the United States has by no means uh, clean hands when it comes to this stuff. Um, now, I don't have a huge amount of time to go into this today, but because uh, it's a huge topic, but um, one of the interesting parts of the Chomsky piece is the bit about liberation theology, where um, there's a story recounted of how under the Vatican II doctrine uh, and Vatican II council, Pope John the Twenty Third um, sort of announced that um, there would be a kind of a pivot to a um, sort of older um, uh, model of uh, of of, of um, Catholic ideology, uh, one that would sort of take the position and perspective of the poor um, in. Uh, you know, in 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 um, the the way priests would would relate to the poor, um, and try to seek their material advancement. Um, so um, the, uh, um, the this story, the story of Vatican II and liberation theology, is bound up then in a number of cases um like salvador and other and elsewhere in south america where uh, the poor uh, felt empowered and found a language in um in catholic uh, liberation theology to um pursue uh, greater democracy for themselves to pursue greater economic justice for themselves and um one of the um, sort of claims that Chomsky makes, which is very interesting, is how the School of the Americas, which we mentioned earlier on, uh, was uh, central to um, trying to eradicate um, Catholic liberation theology. Um, and of course, the famous uh, story here was the uh, clash with uh, Archbishop Romero um, in uh, Salvador. And um, the um, way that, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, School of the Americas is involved here is through the fact that it was the training ground for many of the paramilitaries and the paramilitary leaders that subsequently went on to become these terrorist organizations to, to, to man and staff and... Uh, uh, create uh, these terrorist organizations in in the south which appear everywhere from brazil to chile to argentina throughout the 60s 70s and 80s and of course a lot of people uh, died um, and there's still a lot of inquiries going on even to this day about uh, where um that these uh, where the murdered people are where the where the bodies are buried and that kind of thing so um clearly it was a very uh, upsetting and difficult time for people living in these parts of the world interestingly um, the Democratic National Committee Platform Committee of 2016, uh, struck between uh, supporters of Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, agreed um, that there should be closure of the School of the Americas. Um, and I quote, our support of democracies and civilian governments in the Western Hemisphere includes our belief that their military and police forces should never be involved in the political process, and therefore we will reinstate 2000 congressional mandate uh, the 2000 uh, congressional mandate to close the School of the Americas, now known as the WHI, excuse me, WHIN SEC. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, obviously it's still a controversial uh, place, uh, the School of the Americas. It's it's a school, a uh, college sort of built purposely for the um, training of um, um, uh, army officers in uh, in the south uh, but it has a in south america but it has an ideological uh, sort of history as well and is proud according to chomsky uh, and some of the documents he's looked at quite proud of its role in the downfall of um, a liberation theology um, Chomsky concludes uh, by looking at the destruction in Afghanistan and Iraq and wondering, well, you know, if the goal really was to destroy terrorism, to go to war on terror, then why has the U.S. and uh, why have the Western governments generally pursued policies that were almost 100% likely to generate uh, even more terror? It, it makes no sense, he argues. Indeed, he notes the invasion of Iraq generated, um, arguably, has generated seven times the amount of terrorism that we had beforehand. So, 
um, you know, in the, the in this context, then you've got to sort of look at ISIS and things like that, um, and their presence uh, on the world stage today, and ask, you know, you know, would would that have been possible without uh, the removal of Saddam Hussein? Um, I think it's fairly obvious that uh, Saddam Hussein um, may may not have been a great guy, but uh, to go in and decapitate a regime, a military dictatorship that was holding together uh, three disparate cultural groups, um, you know, without any sort of uh, prior thought about how to rebuild the state, uh, invest in that state, create viable uh, governance structures. Um, you know, it, it was naive and a costly, a costly error um, that's uh, cost a lot of lives and uh, and has created. Um, uh, many many risks and pot the potential for future terrorism um, he does offer one little example at the end about um, Northern Ireland and uh, I think that's really interesting because obviously I, I grew up in Ireland and I um, lived through the period of time that he's referring to uh, where the British actually did really um, finally sort of sit down and talk to the terrorists um, because remember, terrorists aren't just evildoers, right? They are uh, usually politically motivated, which means they have political goals. And if they have political goals, then you can negotiate with those goals. And uh, the British were publicly saying they wouldn't negotiate, but privately, secretly, they were in the 90s. And ultimately, that's what um, brought people to the table and what diffused the situation. And consequently, today, we have um, something much more peaceful in the north of Ireland than we would have had up to that point in time. So in this slide, uh, I don't have a lot to say about the Akbal Ahmed uh, piece. Um, uh, this is a picture of Ronald Reagan uh, meeting with uh, the Afghan rebels, the Mujahideen in the White House in 1985, uh, where Ronald Reagan famously pronounced that these gentlemen are the moral equivalents of America's founding fathers. And it's just, again, this emphasis on this point that one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist and how these roles can switch historically. Uh, the Mujahideen subsequently um, came to be seen um, in uh, post 9-11 context as um, the Taliban. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 they, uh, are, you know, sort of became public enemy number one for having uh, given material support and encouragement to Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda as they were operating um, in Afghanistan. But don't forget the reason al-Qaeda were ever in Afghanistan was that they had all gone there to join the Mujahideen in the struggle against the Soviets, and they received money and missiles um, and technologies to attack the Soviets um, who were present in Afghanistan at the time. Um, so Reagan wanted to defeat the Russians in Afghanistan and, and uh, brought in radical Islamists in order to do it. Um, and this is what Chalmers Johnson, who I mentioned at the start of the lecture, uh, called blowback. You know, the the uh, the action that you haven't predicted, that's uh, a result, an unintentional result uh, of your own action. So um, it, blowback is kind of the logic of unintended consequences expressed in military terms. Um, it, things might things might blow back at you in a way that you hadn't expected, and clearly, I think that's uh, Akbar, Akbar Ahmed's point um, in in bringing this up. So he talks about a number of ideas, and I think that, that this is clearly a tongue-in-cheek piece. I think it's meant humorously. Um, uh, it's taken from a speech, a public speech, so it's not really intended to be an analytical piece. But uh, that's not to say there aren't some really important points being made here. And one of them is, of course, the, the, the point to do with definitions and the impossibility of defining terrorism, really, um, because one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. There's, um, there's, there's a, a terrible flimsiness in the, in the definition of terrorism, uh, which is um, kind of overlooked by those who um, you know, get a, a high and mighty and puff up their chests about war on terror and that kind of thing, evildoers, etc., what uh, uh, Iqbal Ahmed sort of wants to uh, talk about is the fact that we need to really try to consider what the causality of terrorism is. Um, we have a kind of a selective moral revulsion, he says, um, that we um, sort of obsess about um, terrorists killing one person, 
uh, forgetting that state-sponsored terrorism can kill hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so, um, you know, where where does where does the the kind of terrorism that we get worked up about come from? Um, one point, uh, and, and if we ask that question, maybe we can find a way to get past our selective moral revulsion because there's a historical tie, of course, between the two. Uh, terrorism, uh, Akbal uh, Akbal Ahmed argues, comes from on page one eighty nine. He says, "Battered people." Um, is, a, is central here, you know. So the the Jewish terrorists that um, were involved in the starting of the state of Israel, um, who um, threw out many Palestinian people from their lands in the 1940s, um, had come themselves from um, Eastern Europe, where they had been terrorized uh, by the Nazis. Um, you know, so they were a battered people, and today. Um, from the 60s onwards, people who hijack airlines and, uh, you know, maybe even uh, engage in suicide bombing um, are themselves kind of battered people coming from bat battered lands. Uh, um, and if they're not themselves coming from battered lands, because, of course, this piece was written before 9-11 and we know the Saudi Arabian um, uh, pilots of those airliners that went into the World Trade Center were, were not themselves necessarily battered, but the moral support that they received in the Middle East was very prevalent among people who were from marginal backgrounds. Um, so, um, you know, with this in mind, uh, the, 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 the closing advice of uh, Akbal Ahmed is for the West not to engage in double standards in its foreign policy, and to remember that um, terrorism comes from somewhere a strong emotional intent behind it, strong political intent behind it. Um, these aren't evildoers. And if you're going to go around condemning people for their terrorism, do remember that uh, while they might kill thousands of people um, in something like the 9-11 attacks, um, the, uh, the, 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 the long history of US-sponsored state terrorism has, you know, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people who have died. Um, so, um, you know, just remember that. Remember that uh, terrorism is something used by many, many different types of people in different contexts. Um, um, always remember there's a political goal behind terrorism and um, to simply dismiss it or reduce it to, you know, evildoers or people that must be eliminated um, is sort of doing yourself a disservice. So I'm going to stop this video here and I'll, I'll do the Graber stuff in a, in a follow-up uh, video in just a moment.